The year is 1979 and Britain has just elected its first female Prime Minister. The Premiership of Margaret Thatcher is characterised by the privatisation of many previous state enterprises. And while British Rail is excluded from this, it is expected to operate increasingly as a corporate entity with profit at its centre. The election of John Major as Prime Minister in 1990 would see another shift in the way that British Rail is operating, with privatisation now on the cards in 1994. Throughout this period, British Rail is fighting a battle for survival and its very being. Today in Rails to Nowhere, we'll be looking at how this impacted its adoption of various technological advances that presented themselves to it through the 1980s and 1990s. Hello and welcome back to Rails to Nowhere. My name is Simon and as ever I'm joined by the fantastic Ella. Hi. Hi, I'm fiddling with settings. So this is the third and final part of our long running now, longer running than anticipated, VR and technology and innovation series. So in this episode we're moving into the 1970s and on to the mid-1990s. So we're moving right up to privatisation. We're covering the fallout of the winter of discontent. Um, we're covering the Thatcher and the major years. One could um, say this will be a major episode. <laughs> yes. Before we carry on, just a quick thank you to our wonderful patrons for your support. You help keep the podcast uh, rolling. And we've got quite a lot coming in 2023, hopefully. Fingers crossed. I've got big plans. Yeah. I've got some plans related to some academic work I'm doing. Yeah, so some really exciting things coming up um, for 2023, and we are really excited for that. Um, but before we can get on to that, I guess we need to get on with today's show. So, as I keep saying in this series, we can't really look at the railway in this period without looking at what's going on outside. And in the last two episodes, we've sort of gone from the fallout of the Second World War to the winter of discontent through the growth of the motor car, changes in the airline industry. And we're seeing a lot of those same themes again in this episode. Notably, we're seeing the winter of discontent really bring a proper end to any semblance of the post-war consensus. We talked about how if that had existed, it basically did exist by the late 1960s, and it's absolutely out of the window now. And the winter of discontent also sees us gain a new form of politics in the Tory party. From our point of view, the sense that this is what the Tory party is, this is what the Conservatives are, is that just is who they are. But really, the arrival of Thatcher at the top of the Tory party is a real shift in the tone and direction and economic ideas that the party's pushing. It's a very different way of perceiving on how a country should be run. It's a very different way of conceiving how country uh, finance should work. And this is the privatisation era. That's the really mm. big thing. Like, don't get me wrong, there's been some privatisations between 48 and, and the 1970s. Things like the road industry, there's been a little bit of deregulation and privatisation of goods transport because there was a brief period where a large chunk of that was sort of nationalised and then it quite quickly went back to being privatised again. But this is the period where we're seeing the water and the electricity and the railways and the post office and parts of the NHS and all of that sort of stuff start to properly begin to be privatised. Not all of those things get privatised fully in this period for a variety of reasons, but we start seeing that process really kick in. That's the thing Thatcher's really famous for. Yes, it's the period where Thatcher comes out, stands on a doorstep with a basket of groceries and claims this is how you should run a country. Yeah, so as I say, Thatcher is domestic policy is best known for her policy of privatisation and union suppression. Notably, both of these policies are targeted around making what she viewed as unproductive, lazy, unprofitable, nationalised industries attractive to the private sector. Now, I think both me and Ella would disagree on whether that's a right assessment of what these industries were and what they're for, but that's certainly the policy that she's pursuing. Interestingly, the railway falls into a interesting category for the Thatcher government, which is that it's viewed as a failure. Thatcher views the railway as a dead industry in many ways, and she 
thinks that it can never, by and large, be made profitable and therefore can never be interesting to the private sector. And so because of that, rail privatisation is... It's talked about, don't get me wrong. There are minutes and discussions within government talking about do we try privatising the railways and how might we do that? But basically Thatcher decides that A, it's too complicated. B, it's inherently failing and dying and the government would never be able to sell it off. Interestingly, I think a lot of that's based on that the way the railways would be privatised by the Thatcher government would be the same as like how British Gas or any of the other privatisations happened, that it would be sold as a business unit. So you'd need somebody who would be interested in buying British Rail. And everything that that entails. Yeah, so a very different privatisation to what we got in the end, which we'll talk a little bit more about slightly later on. Re remember at this point, British Rail essentially consists of one massive overarching organisation within which you have your passenger and freight operations, you've got your track maintenance, yeah. you've got... Uh, British Rail Engineering and the Research Division, and it, it's a juggernaut as compared to yeah. what we see in, in privatisation in Britain later on, obviously, where we see everything yeah. broken up into a, almost as small a unit as possible. I'm sure if yeah. they could break it down more, they would. And this is the problem with British Rail, is you've got chunks like Network South East that are profitable, but then they're having to pour money into regional railways mm. to cross-subsidise it and overall the business as a whole is not very profitable. If at all ever. So the Thatcher government doesn't really try to privatise the railways but its objective of commercialising it, of businessifying it, does have a massive impact on the railway and we'll talk a little bit more about some of those impacts later. The major administration I would argue is then very much a force into to doing two principal things with its time in government. One, desperately trying to prove that it is as Thatcherite as Thatcher was. And two, desperately trying not to lose the 1992 and then the 1996 election. But then once it becomes clear that it is going to lose the 1996 election, frantically doing whatever it can to create a legacy for itself. Realistically, the, the major government is typified by desperately trying to have a legacy, but a variety of other events occurring that prevent it from having any sort of coherent policy. Whereas Thatcher was very much the captain of the ship, mm. John Major is very much chief firefighter. Yep. That's sort of my back of the envelope analysis of those two administrations. I would argue that's mostly correct. I think that what we also see is almost, a, a, in some ways, quite a weak leadership too within yeah. the party at this point. Whereas Thatcher obviously came out, was very strong. We know, you know, she's famous for being the Iron Lady. Major is quite forgettable, quite frankly, to the point where a lot of people I talk to forget that Major even happened. Yeah, and that's partially because Major is a compromise candidate between mm. the Thatcherite and the Eurosceptic and the pro-Europe and yep. the old-school Tories, all of whom are bickering. And Major is often portrayed as being a bland grey figure and to many ways he's elected because he is a blank canvas into which everyone can sort of pour their idea of what he's going to be. And that drives a lot of Major's policy because you look at a lot of Major's policy and we'll explore that a bit with the railways. There's a lot of him trying to adopt a little bit of everybody's policy Quite. to please everyone. So how does this translate into the railways? We, we, we should probably move on to our, our core topic. of Yes, we should probably move on to our actual topic and not politics. <laughs> yeah, I know. I did a politics degree for my undergraduate. Ella is uh, obviously a historian as well. Talking about politics and old politics specifically is kind of our um, It's forte. our... It's what we do. Yeah. So we'll talk more in detail about privatisation in a nebulous future episode that we both want to run at some point, like a prop, we want to pro do a proper in-depth discussion of privatisation. But it's impossible to look at this period of BR's history without really understanding that BR knows that privatisation is always over the horizon. Yes, and that quite significantly will impact how you run any sort yeah. of public business, knowing that yeah. if, well you've got no threat of something like privatisation, you know that you can more or less work on an assumption that things will just keep going and you will 
at the yeah. end of the day have a pot of money to work with you will not be demanded to be profitable in the same way that a private entity might be meanwhile if you're being told you know privatization it's, it's coming it's coming it's coming you're going yeah. to need to get yourself profitable and be in a profitable in a way that shareholders and businesses want so that when it does happen you don't instantly get dissolved and yeah asset stripped which this is what drives a lot of brs asset stripping in some yes. ways like there are parts of asset stripping within br but it's also of course what drives um sectorization and sectorization is also somewhere where we see a massive difference between the sectors in terms of what they're able to do mm. and you start seeing not br as a whole in so much as br as a whole ever existed we've talked a little bit about how the regions impacted a lot of stuff back in the first part of this series but you again see br split asunder into four business units by itself and then subsequently by major into even further smaller chunks to the point where you have some sectors able to order things from one supplier and no one has any yeah. problems to others where you get the private sector realizing that there's actually a very lucrative offer going down here fighting yeah. to for every scrap as we see with things like the networkers versus the sprinter classes while one is aiming to essentially be a unit that can be bought on mass to run around the country and are not very profitable lines yeah. so therefore it's a risk for private sectors to engage with the much more lucrative network southeast is looking for their networkers and we see Metro Camel demand to be part of that order, even though there yeah. was no good reason for them to be. But it's done so then because they realize that they can make more profit from it. And the interesting thing is that some of the biggest technological adoptions within this period are kind of some of the smallest ones mm. and the sort of quietest ones. Because as ever, it's sort of the really small steps, the little things that go the best. So, for example, Network Southeast and later Intercity and Regional Railways begin rolling out better computing, new ticketing systems. Network Southeast rolls out a better computer system for its telephone inquiry bureau, yep. which allow both the inquiries personnel to better answer questions because they've got better, more live information, but it also provides better routing for phone calls as well and means that rather than having to have everyone sit in a big office in Waterloo, Network Southeast is able to use this technology to split the Telephone Inquiry Bureau up into smaller regional centres, which means when you ring in with your inquiry about stuff going on in Kent, you actually get the person sitting in the Kent office who understands that bit of the network better rather than having just one big room where everyone's expected to understand everything, yep. which provides some improvements to customer service. It's also things like the rolling out of, well, now obsolete or becoming obsolete, Aptis and Portis yep. computer and ticketing systems, which again improve passengers' ability to access fares. It improves places like the Telephone Inquiry Bureau's ability to inquire about fares and tell you how much something's going to cost and even begins to be able to start selling fares more remotely. Yep, and you also get the rollout of the idea on Network Southeast again of the mileage-based maintenance rather than a system where yep. things go wrong and you fix, you rectify things. So it's more like you would do with a car where you yep. hit, say, 100,000 miles driven, you take it and get the engine swapped. I don't know, I don't drive, would you believe? Yep. Or whereas Network Southeast goes, oh, this train has now done its 100,000 miles, let's please... Yep go and get the traction motors and the brake pads and it, give it a full once over so it's safe yeah and that improves reliability yep. and it also reduces costs a little bit because it means that because for example in the old system if you've got a train that's constantly on the all day london to birmingham mm. service but then one train that's actually always constantly on the peak hour only service but you're saying every train just gets looked at every month the one that's doing only the peak hour services is not doing that many miles it's going into the depot way more than it needs to and it's the hogging one that's time just doing london birmingham london birmingham london birmingham london birmingham all day is doing way more miles and is not seeing the engineers quite enough so it, again it improves the the costs it improves reliability and again it's like tops it's a sort of small mm. improvement in how the records are kept and what records you're keeping and suddenly there's a a, a noticeable improvement yeah. in the reliability and the performance of the network also following on from what we've talked about before in the previous episode we discussed automatic warning system um srws as well yeah 
And this era is no different in there being advances in signalling technology and safety in the railway. One of the big innovations is the creation of what's called the Integrated Electronic Control Centre, IECC, which is really the first what we'd recognise now as computerised yes. signalling system. Like Obviously, some of the old electronic signalling systems are computers in some ways but this is the first time that we see what we would see now and your lay person would look at that and go yes that's a computer yes because this is where you get the classic mission control style kind of curved desks with lots of big computer monitors and a big yeah. screen up against the wall and people sit behind a computer with the trackball rather than sitting yeah. in front of a panel and pushing buttons on a panel to set routes yeah. things are set on a computer monitor which then either connects to a relay interlocking or later on the solid state interlocking yeah which is the development of this point too yeah and so this allows for um better clarity for the signalers it provides better information flow more real-time information of the state of the railway as well yeah and allows again like all these sort of control system upgrades it allows signalers to operate greater chunks of railway and to do so more reliably yeah the first of these is Liverpool Street, which controls a large chunk of the Great Eastern Main Line from one place. The, the other thing you get as well on the signalling front with the solid state interlocking and the IECC is the is the introduction of the ARS system, the automatic routing system, where yeah. the timetables for the trains are loaded into the computer system and all things going well, the computer can essentially route trains on its own without the yeah. intervention of a signaller. Which is again why signallers are able to control more, more track mileage because their role moves from an active to becoming more supervisory of the computer. Yes, they're a supervisor rather than a person who is actively making decisions. But they still can take full control of a problem area and whenever you see trains in problem areas, it's more or less that the signaller is routing them themselves rather than the computer because when trains arrive out of order or trains arrive late, ARS, it's not, yeah. And... On the other end of the scale for signalling, you also have the Radio Electronic Token Block, or RETB, appear at this point. So Token Block is a system of signalling that's been in use since, well, since signalling was first introduced yep. on the railways, really. And the principle of it is that you have a physical thing, this is called your token, the signaller gives it to you. There's either only one in existence or there's a very complicated machine that means that only one can be issued at any one time. And the signaller gives you that and it says there is no other train on this line. Yep. You can go. It's a stick or a key that literally says yeah. valid between, say... Aberystwyth and Dovey Junction, yeah, there we go. Aberystwyth and Dovey Junction. And by physically holding this object, you are permitted to go here. Yeah. But this is massively staff intensive and resource intensive because they're expensive they are complicated machines and you need a signaler very regularly to be able to issue these yeah or you need to have many 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 miles of telecoms cables which you get yeah. in more rural parts but then you have the issue of if telecoms go down you no longer can signal trains it's a very very complicated system I didn't put it in the notes, but there's something, I believe it's something happens on the far north line that basically renders the existing system broken or out of date or something. I can't for the life of me remember what it is, but there is some trigger that means British Rail looks at these very rural lines. We're talking really, really rural lines. We're talking about things like the the far north line out north from Inverness, Up to um, the West Wick. Highland line from... Glasgow up to Fort William and Oban, yep. and the Cambrian coastline out from um, Shrewsbury to Aberystwyth and Pucheli. Proper single track on it, basically, you're the only person in existence for miles. RETB is a system based on a VHF radio system. Every train gets a radio transmitter and receiver unit, and the signal cabin has a radio transmitter and receiver as well, and a computer. On the computer, the signaller goes, this section of line is clear. I'm going to allow, say, train 2002, 2002 into this section. And they issue the token. The driver is told, press a button. And then a burst of noise, or what sounds like noise, but is actually digital data, is broadcast. And then the train now has the signal saying that 2002 can go between 
Aberystwyth and Dovey Junction. And then yeah. there's a similar thing on the re- on the return where the signal will request the token back. The driver pushes another button. A load of noise happens. And then the signaler now has possession of this digital token. It's a very yeah. simple system. It's only sending a few hundred bytes of data. But it's a very, very simple and effective system that has one source of authority, which is very important in signaling. You need to have that definitive mm-hmm. trusted source. But it's a very clever way of solving a problem of how do we yep. run signals and this token block system without having to fit all this very intensive and very expensive electronic infrastructure. Yeah, and importantly, is enabled by the existence of these sort of new solid state interlocking and yes. better computerized interlockings. Because for those who aren't familiar with how railway signaling works, there's this thing called interlocking, which back in the days of steam was a physical series of things that lock yep. the mechanical systems. I think we've talked about this a bit before. And it's vital for making sure that trains don't crash into each other, which is why we need better computer technology. And this is really only enabled by this. And even then, to make it as safe as mechanical things, preventing other mechanical things as moving, you have three computers doing a voting system. And it's a very complicated set of mathematics that makes this a definitive and safe system. And then this is how all modern signalling also works, is you have the three things, and two out of the three have to agree. Yes. And that's what allows the thing to happen. 99% of the time, all three agree. But the important thing is it provides backup and it provides verification. It provides a level of redundancy that's appropriate so that you can have that one fail. The technician go in and look at it, but the other two can continue to operate safely in that interim. We talked last time about Southern Region signal repeating AWS and the concerns with the sort of AWS system that existed. And through the 1980s, we see development of what's called automatic train protection. So this is the implementation of computer-based signaling infrastructure that would intervene should a train do something that it's not authorized to do. So while AWS is an advisory system, it alerts the driver to the state of the road ahead. It doesn't intervene if the driver passes a signal at danger. Mm. So long as the driver says, yes, I've heard the warning, the train will continue Mm -hmm. to operate as the driver instructs. ATP is about taking some level of control away from the driver, only really in those instances where something's going wrong to bring a train safely to a stand. So, for example, it would intervene um, if a train passes a signal at red. Well, actually, it wouldn't even at that point because it would have intervened beforehand because it's designed to know the train's not going to stop at the signal and would have intervened to prevent that. Yes, the earliest forms of ATP have existed for actually a very long time in yeah. signalling. The London Underground... There are mechanical versions. Yep. yep, London Underground uses a mechanical form of automatic train protection known as the train stop. It's much less clever, but it sets the emergency brakes yep. off if a train goes past the signal at red. It has got Some more clever as time's control. gone on, and it's integrated things like speed control... This is used on metros throughout the world yes. because very quickly when you're operating as frequently as metro services do, it became very obvious that you needed very good safety systems. So places like New York, Berlin, Paris have all got some sort of mechanical train stop system very early on. Yes, it does have limits, however. It's very difficult to mm. do speed control with it. It's very difficult to yep. do approach control with it that's not massively yep. complicated on the track side side. And as we saw with the Chiltern Railways incident a couple of years back now, it can also be overridden and dangerous things can yeah. happen where people may have not follow procedure. It's also very procedure-based yeah. as well to make it completely safe. Yeah. So BR looks at two different versions of ATP. It looks at a version from GEC Alstom, which is based off of the German LZB system, which is going to make Ella smile and very happy. Yep to hear that mentioned and that is installed on the Chiltern routes so these are the railways running out of Marylebone up to Aylesbury and towards Birmingham and there is the GW Great Western ATP which is produced by a Belgian company based on their ACEC um, control system yep. that's used over in 
Belgium. There's some technical differences between them, but essentially they are broadly the same thing. And the driver sees yeah. the same thing in the cab. It's yeah. minor technical details as to how that information is got to them, though. Both of these are what's called intermittent systems. You have two types of ATP. There's what's called intermittent and there's what's called continuous. Intermittent is where you only receive information at certain locations and continuous is where you're always receiving updated information. So, for example, the train stop system we were just talking about, that would be an intermittent system. You're only receiving information at the red signal or at the point that the train is being speed controlled. Something like the communications-based train control used on the Elizabeth line is what's called a continuous system. The train is always talking to the signalling and always continually getting updated information. Yes. These fall a little bit between those two because there's more intervention points. Yes. And there's, importantly, two-way communication. Yes, that's the other key thing. There's two-way communication and there's some other technical information that means that you have to do things like have release speeds and so on if you want to learn more about how the system functions from a driver's perspective, you can go on YouTube. There is a whole yep. video and there's also a book. I would recommend Two Centuries of Railway Signalling, which is a very good book about all sorts of railway stuff. And it's got a good write up on um, ATP. And as ever, I mean, Two Centuries of Railway Signalling is in the bibliography for this, as are a couple of articles written at the time talking about how yep. ATP functions as well. And whereas an underground train doesn't know where the train stops are, it just encounters them if, if it goes past a red signal. On the ATP system, the train knows where to expect information from the signalling system as well. So if the signalling system fails to say, hello, here we are, you're good to continue, the train goes, oh, I haven't had the information, I need to stop, alert the driver that something's wrong, and then the driver can talk to the signaller. So again, it's a step up in the safety. And it's fail safe again. Yeah. Which is the key thing you need to know with signaling. It must be, in general, basically all signaling stuff is fail safe. Now, an intermittent system is not as good as a continuous system, but it's considered to be good enough. And it, mm -hmm. it is good enough, but it's chosen because it's cheaper, yeah. which, again, is a providing factor of BR at all points. Yes. It's not to say that continuous systems don't exist at this time as well. Ireland adopts no. the continuous AWS system, which essentially yep. puts... It's a bit similar to the SI um, AWS, where you have in the cab a copy of the next signal, essentially. Yep. And it can update that to either step up or restrict the aspect but it's yep. a very simple system too and it's much of a muchness really it doesn't have speed yep. information which atp does in britain but then yep. it's a continuous system so everything is swings and roundabout we talked a bit about cost just a second ago and cost becomes a factor again atp atp is expensive like sr aws it's very expensive it's much more expensive than the alternatives and the decision is made pretty much as privatisation is coming in that it is not worth the cost. Notably, Railtrack, which is the privatised owner of the track that the major government brings in in the early 1990s, changes its assessment of how much a human life is worth in the event of an incident. So when deciding what safety systems should be implemented, there's always this sort of comparison of the cost of it versus the value of potential loss of Quite life. Morbid. Yeah, it's a little bit morbid, I'm afraid. So Railtrack has a lower figure for how much it feels a human life is worth compared to what British Rail has. And that therefore means that the amount of money it's prepared to pay for safety system improvements is lower than BR maybe would have. It's important to consider in the context as well that there were various reports published before privatisation and after privatisation about various accidents that were considered yep. to be ATP preventable, where an ATP system yes. would have prevented the incident from occurring and potentially saved a lot of lives. Also important to note that ATP as implemented is not infallible and it is possible to isolate an operator train full without speed it. without. So we would note it's either South Hall or Ladbroke Grove, and I can't remember which of those two, is caused because the driver of one of the trains has isolated their APT. 
but Railtrack therefore adopts what's called the Train Protection and Warning System, or TPWS, which is a cheaper system and is essentially an electromagnetic version of train stops. Yes, if you've ever stood at a platform and looked at a signal and you see a weird kind of metal grid bolted into the sleepers, yep. this is the TPWS system in action, at least the track yeah. side components. Yeah, and so TPWS is decided to be installed at high-risk locations initially. Mm -hmm. So that would be places where tracks converge, so there's a high risk of a crash if a signal is passed at stage, and is considered to be a cheaper system. It provides enforcement at certain speed restrictions, certain key signals, and in terminal platforms. And it is broadly yeah. comparable to the London Underground train stop system, but it's not completely rolled out across the network. It's still not rolled out across parts of the portions. network today. Although, again, there's been a change in the, the attitude towards these sort of things, and there is a growing sense that actually more of the network should be fitted with TPWS yeah. than was considered as suitable for fitting in the 90s. And also considerations on how TPWS should intervene in certain locations too. Yeah. Should it be have, say, higher speed enforcement? Should it have lower speed enforcement? It's a very complicated thing, and I highly recommend going and reading the Kirkby incident report, Yeah, where they discuss how TPWS has failed to protect a train. Yes, it has its problems, and it, it's again chosen because it's cheap, and it's again chosen because we're coming into privatisation, and rail track is a private business, it's a shareholder-owned business, and there are incidents, as I say, such as Labrook Grove and South Hall and Potter's Bar that are all caused as a result of the changes in safety culture and safety priorities in this period. Mm -hmm. So let's move away from the morbidity of signalling and move swiftly on to rolling mm -hmm. stock. Now, this period, there is a massive investment in rolling stock mm -hmm. there's a lot of new trains come into the network at this point and a lot of them still survive to this day yeah a lot of them do let's start off with the regional fleet mm -hmm. so regional railways is the branch of british railways operating local services across most of the uk so you've got the three sectors you've got network southeast which operates commuter services in london and the southeast and you've got intercity which operates intercity services and then you've got regional railways that is everything else it's very well divided, as you can see. A regional railways has this real issue that most of its fleet, in fact, all of its fleet, uh, come the start of the 1970s, is from the 1950s and or earlier, and is starting to show its age, and its reliability yes. is starting to fall. So they're on the lookout for a new fleet of trains. Yes. To give an idea of what we're dealing with here, we're dealing with a lot of the Derby lightweights, we're dealing with locomotive yep. hauled stock to Mark 1 coaches, and we're dealing with a lot of that sort of very cheap, we've got the 101s still, and yep. that sort of era, that sort of class of train, very old, very, a lot of them very mechanically intensive too, especially the Derby lightweights, which are entirely mechanically geared, and lots of other... Yep. Very expensive to maintain, expensive to run units that, while everyone I think loved at the time, I'm sure, were not good for the maintenance or running costs. No. And so we see the seeking of a new regional fleet. There's wanting for both a local regional fleet and an express regional fleet. But it's the local regional fleet that I think has the most controversy attached to it. Because Correct. essentially the decision is taken that British Rail, as a nationalised industry should support the operations of another nationalised industry. And realistically, I think this is the main priority behind the purchase of the Pacer. Now, the Pacer is considered to be... It's, it's one of these things that, that sounds cheap, looks cheap, and actually isn't that cheap. Because the idea of the Pacer is we take bits that British Leyland make for buses and we turn that into a train. And that sounds like it should be really cheap and easy, because buses are cheap and easy, isn't it? The problem is that trains still have a lot of complex costs. Uh, we talked a bit about the Pacer last episode, and uh, one of the big things that enables the Pacer is the high-speed freight wagon, which also spawned research into the APT. Mm -hmm. And the Pacer is purchased because it's considered to be cheap. Now, there's some research been done recently by Dr. David Turner and Dr. Kevin Tennant. Mm-hmm 
who have questioned and brought into question the idea that actually the pacer was cheaper or that it actually saved any lines because there's also this argument that the pacer saves branch lines and rural routes the problem is at this stage we've just had the massively unpopular beaching cuts which Mm -hmm. uh, it's the anniversary this year of the report and there's a lot to be said about the beaching report and we're not going to get into that right now there will be an episode at some point in the future but we're not getting into that right now but there's a lot of political backlash against that and kevin tennant and david turner have argued that actually it's very unlikely that lines would have closed in this period yes if i there's a lot of paces ending up going to city networks is the best way to describe them your yeah. metros rather than going on these regional routes this is the other thing is the paces proved to be very bad for the regional routes that they're yes. proposed for so they end up going in a lot of urban routes mm. and then the regional routes that apparently needed this really cheap train to be able to stay open stay open anyway Yes, which undermines this argument. And realistically, what we find is the provincial sector being forced into a really terrible compromise of buying stock that's really not fit for any of the roles it really needs Mm. and leaving a legacy of that, which has only um, recently, the paces have been withdrawn after about 40 years of service. Yes. It's important also to recognise what they were being placed up against as the alternative stock. The Class Mm. 210 was the prototype units that were essentially a 317 electric train or a 455 electric train that were destined for semi-fast and metro-style services. But instead of having a third rail pickup or a pantograph, you instead install a diesel engine in the front third of the front carriage and run the train off of diesel power instead now that ends up having problems because it's noisy and it's heavy and it's it is quite expensive yes but it's also the first foray into doing diesels in the mark three body shell and a lot of other things it's actually quite an interesting train in of itself and i believe one of the units ends up going and fixing a 455 in the end i think it does yes it does because the concrete mixer drops on it and that essentially spawns into the Sprinters. These are initially the Mark III body base Class 150 DMUs. Yep. This is then followed by the Class 156 and the Class 155. So the 150 is designed for suburban and city service. The 155 and the 156 are designed for sort of semi-fast services. So they've got the doors at the ends. Yep. And then you get the Express Sprinter or the Super Sprinter, which is the 158. So you get the sprinters, and they're essentially an evolution of existing designs. They're an evolution of the Mark III body shell and ideas that have been coming around before. They're nothing particularly flashy, most of them, but they do bring a real step change in the technology. Uh, Well, not necessarily the technology, but in the customer experience. Just like these little bits of technology. You've got sliding air-operated doors rather than slam doors. You've got better seating, better lighting, better public address systems usable by the guard. Don't get me wrong, I'm aware that some of them are rather rubbish. On some of the later versions, so the 158, you've got air conditioning. Yeah, and even novel things such as a telephone that you can use on the move. Yep, I recently discovered that some of the networkers had had telephones oh, really? um, in them. Yeah, apparently 365s. Oh, the happy telephones. train. Yeah. Interesting, never heard that. But the sprinters provide a real improvement in comfort and a real change in passenger service and it's the sort of thing that i think is a good example of the sort of thing that regional railways and british railways trying to achieve at this point is improving service they don't always hit the mark but they try and some of our listeners may not particularly love sprinters because they have been in service now for 30 40 years now and they are getting tired but at the time they really are a massive improvement in what came before them quite so it's also important to recognize the under the hood changes that mean that br is saving money saving time yep. coupled with adopting things like a mileage based maintenance system the trains are lighter yep. as well which means they're cheaper to run more fuel efficient and they can even go faster if you ever see a sign on by the railway that says sprinter with a speed restriction mm. that is because these trains were lighter and therefore could go faster
faster without damaging the track yep. as badly as, say, taking a locomotive down there. That's not to say they didn't have some problems. Yep. And um, the 158s notably had some problems with their brakes originally. Yep. <laughs> so you get some interesting pictures of half a 158 and half a 156 coupled together to solve that. But realistically, I think the Sprinter and the Pacer is a good example of the sort of political problem that British Rail's having at this point because it's being forced by government to follow their agenda so it has to buy the pacers because it has to support british lane and because as a nationalized industry it has to prop up other nationalized industries whereas actually that's not the ideal train and the sprinter is really the much better train that british rail would much rather have but as kevin and david have sort of identified in some of their research there's kind of already this sense that when the pacer appears the decision has been taken that the pacer has to be proved to be a good move because that's what the powers that be want to happen yep so we're going to brush over Intercity a little bit because Intercity doesn't do huge amounts in this period No, that we haven't already kind of talked about. So we spoke about the HST and the APT in the last episode. This period we see the introduction of the Intercity 225 or the Electra. Yep, my child. <laughs> which is brought in for the electrification of the East Coast Main Line. Again, it, it's an evolution of what's come before because Correct. it's kind of the melding of the HST and the APT concepts. And it, it is an evolution of the APT design. If you are interested in these sort of things, Gareth Dennis has done an interesting alternative yep. history of the APT in which the APT just becomes the 225. And that's what it was destined to be. If you look in yeah. the archives, as I discuss in our APT episode, in the archives you find all sorts of references to a final production version of APT that is essentially a 225 set, but with the APT's features of tilting and all the other wonderful things yep. that APT was supposed to bring. And the modern Intercity 225 Electra set is essentially it's an apt the power car is based off apt technology the coaches are based off the apt designs of you do extrusion and other very clever aircraft techniques to make them and they even were able to be fitted with tilt right up until project mallard so they're most certainly yeah. the evolution of the design they also incorporate elements of the 125 into them as you'd expect and they really are a massive step up mm. from what's come before they a lot of new stuff but notably br is still in intercity travel lagging behind a lot yes. of european network this is certainly no tgv not just not in the speed mm. but like just not in what it is it yes. just isn't a tgv it isn't an ice it isn't quite up to the same specs as previous thing mm. and of course it's also running on the conventional network entirely yeah. it's got no dedicated lines and while we do have footage and test reports of where they did run it up to the 140 mile an hour mark it was essentially canned over safety uh, because of the signaling yep. and also practicality you add that again what seems like a very small increase in speed but is actually a massive headache when you're working yeah. with a mixed operations. And it, yeah, and it really, again, represents the sort of cost cutting and the penny pinching and the saving that's being forced on BR. Because again, we're seeing intercity high speed trains being rolled out even more so on the shared network rather than a dedicated high speed line being built. We're also seeing the East Coast mainline electrification being carried out on the cheap, which still causes problems to this day. Yep. With the overhead line electrics being subject to falling down from time to time. Yeah, they like to get eaten by pantographs and all sorts of other things that the more sensibly is the best way to put it, the ones that had the investment yep. done do not suffer from. People complain about the Great Western's electrification, but it's an example of learning from the mistakes of the East yep. Coast of build it very well so it's not going to have the same issues and it hasn't yeah. had the same issues in many ways the great western electrification and the very big structures we have there already direct retaliation to the problems of the east coast mainland electrification which is built very cheaply and very lightly and we also have the intercity 250 i want to i i do want to talk about this at some point but I, yes. I haven't had a chance to do proper research on it. it's going to take some digging because the stuff's all kind of buried there's the intercity 250 almost nothing is published. the next yeah is the next project after the Intercity 225, and it's designed to be the next phase of railway for the West Coast Main Line. All of these trains, they get names based on the maximum speed they're going to run. So the Intercity 125 runs at 125 miles an hour. The Intercity 225 runs at 225 miles an hour. No, it's, it's 225 kilometers an hour. Yep. It's the design top speed. 140 miles an hour for those who yep. want to work it like that. It never achieves that. Not in revenue service. 
Yeah, sorry, it never achieves that in revenue service. The 125 has achieved 140 miles an hour out of revenue service well. Yeah. So, like, 140 miles an hour is perfectly a thing that these trains have all achieved, but they don't yes. do it in mm. revenue service. And the 225... I want to say a 225 got up to 150. 163, I believe, is the top speed, which is very fast. No, 263, sorry, K. Okay. And the Intercity 250 is designed with an operating speed of 250 kilometers an hour, which I should have looked up how much that was in miles an hour. That's going to be about 150-ish, I guess. Uh, 155 miles an hour. Okay, so we're talking APT speeds. Yeah, so the, the Intercity 250 is designed with an operating speed of 155 miles an hour or 250 kilometers an hour, hence the name. But it never happens because of cost, because of upgrades because it's part of the west coast mainline modernization which doesn't come until after privatization yeah but again like the electro like with the 125 like with the apt this is a desperate attempt to build a faster and faster intercity network on the existing network and in some ways i'm actually quite glad like you look at the design art and all of that like the, the, the model looks beautiful yep there's a model in the nrm in the stores and there's also an excellent transport fever mod based on that model if you mm -hmm. want to see what it might have looked like but for all of its interestingness and beauty like all of these things before it has the fundamental problem of being in city service running on conventional network therefore i hate it because that is fundamentally a bad way to be running the network. But again, it represents the problems of how BR is being pushed to work and that BR basically is continuing since the 1960s yes. right through to its, to its end. Be told, no, you cannot build a segregated high-speed rail network. A decision which we've now, 60 years later, finally accepted that actually we need to yes. just build a segregated high-speed network. And even then aren't properly doing. It's, yeah. it's very we'll do much, a HS2. I was going to say, it's very much political failure at every level, if you ask me. Yeah, at this stage, I think C2024 for a HS2 episode yes. from us. What's, what, isn't, what is interesting, though, is throughout all of this, you do have engineers say, no, we need the separate network, we need the separation, we need to do this yep. separately, we need to do this properly. And at every level, they're blocked because it's yep. expensive. And like so much stuff, it's a political problem, not an engineer. Yes, which is even more sad in some ways when you consider that like the 225s could have, in theory, been fitted with an a the APT system used on the Great Western, which would have allowed mm -hmm. them to operate at their maximum speed, which, while not good yep. for service, for every other service, would allow those particular trains to actually go at their design speed on the network. So the last thing on our list of things to talk about is the networker. We've Very mentioned nice it several train. times. Yes. For both of us, I think the networker provides sound of our youth in many ways. I think less so for you. Cause less you're so a, for me you're because a, I'm... You're a South Central yes. child, whereas I'm a South Eastern and North Eastern London child. So I have grown up surrounded by the various networkers that were built. And the networker is so-called because it is the train for Network South East. Yes. That's what, sort of where its big innovation comes from, in that it's a platform of trains in many ways. Because yes. you look at the, the 365s, you look at the 466s and the 465s, and they are modular. You look at the 166s and the 165s, yep. and again, it's the same body shell, various interchangeable bits, but you take that one type of train and you adapt it for where you want to run it. Yep. There's various proposals for them for installation across Kent, across South London, across Crossrail is meant to get networkers. Yeah, Thameslink is proposed networkers at one yep. point. It's important to also point out that the networker concept is snapped up after privatization by what becomes Bombardier, and yep. the Turbostar and the Electrostar are a direct descendant of the networker. The same platform yep. concept, you have standardized body shells, standardized parts that work basically everywhere, yep. and you just modify it maybe with a slightly different gearing or put a diesel engine under it, change the yep. cab structure depending on what you're doing. Do you want to have gangways? Do you want to have a flat front that's more aerodynamic? And yep. all the other things you see including even things down to how the guard panels work on Electrostars on Southern. Yep. They're configured in a particular way, whereas on other operators, they're configured in a different way. And then you've got the Turbo Stars again, same operators, different configurations. And realistically, this brings us nice full circle back to where we started these three episodes 
with us talking about the exchange trials and the creation of the BR standard mm. steam engines because we find ourselves with the London and Southeast standard train yep. that's designed to be rolled out in different configurations across different purposes. And again, like the sprinters, they bring a real step up in the service and the customer environment for Network Southeast. Yep. We'll do a Network Southeast discussion in a later episode, I'm sure, because it's really interesting to talk about. But they really bring modern cons, they bring better safety, they bring yep. better environment, they bring Longer better trains. lighting, better seating, better doors, all these things. Yep. They bring more reliability, all of this stuff that we've been talking about. And so it's a real step up yep. again for the Southeast. But again, hampered by privatization. It's also important to point out that they're also an example again of BR's cost saving at this point. The yep. 466 or 467, the what are affectionately termed the baby networker, the two car units on yes, Southeastern. Four six sixes, yeah. They're entirely built because BR didn't want to invest in the infrastructure changes to have longer platforms. So yeah. to get more capacity, they instead increased the trains to the maximum of ten cars by ordering the baby networkers, and yeah. that's why we now see these rather cute little trains scurrying around on often just kind of hooked onto an eight car set, you know, two four cars yes. because extra capacity. There are there are some other things on Networker 2 which are quite good. Yep. Aluminium and not steel for construction, lighter trains, better yep. acceleration, lighter. lower costs, and a move away from DC traction, because don't forget most of these operated on the DC network, to yep. AC traction through inverters, which are lighter yep. and more reliable. They generally are more controllable. They use the GTO traction system as a result of being AC which means that they're slightly more controllable and it's why you get that wonderful sound. Yep. Commonality across the networkers, the 323s and the 96 stock on the Jubilee line. Yep, good noises. And because the motors are lighter, it means you can have more of the train motorised. Yep. The earlier stocks, the 317s, the 315s that you mentioned earlier, they only have one motor bogey or two motor bogies at most for a four-car set. Yeah. Generally, the vehicle directly where the electricity enters the train, because you've got all the heavy equipment to try and convert it and so on. Yeah. These trains, you're able to get more vehicles uh, motorized, which means you can have better acceleration, which means you can have faster services and more reliable service. Yeah. So it's a real, it is a real step up. They also have regenerative brakes, which means better braking yeah. and... Uh, they can't do the return the power to the power rails, I don't think. And while regen braking is not returning power to the rails as it would on modern systems, it's again still even more efficient way of braking because you're using electric motors, essentially running them as generators, and that creates a lot of mechanical resistance, which is more than a disc brake can even provide in a lot of yes. cases. Not good at slow speed, but great if you're trying to stop from, say, 70 miles an hour, at a platform. Yes, which is why a lot of sort of modern trains sound like they're motoring as they brake until they reach about 10 miles an hour and then the disc brake kicks in to finally bring it yeah. to a stand. So that really brings us to the end of this episode and this little mini series. At last, it's taken us a year and a half. Yep. Really, we've come full circle. We've gone from the BR standard locomotive to the Network Southeast standard train. Yep. Um, we've seen really how the principal problem for BR's technological um, adoption is really money being provided by the government and political imperatives. And I think that's really the big takeaway from this, that BR has a lot of good ideas and it does implement quite a lot of good innovations, but it's always hampered by what it can get away with on a political and financial level, which is still something the railways struggle with to this day. It's also a great example of a lot of political failure yep. at many levels in government, both from those at the very, very, very top to those who are tasked with carrying out the government's wishes. Yep. Everything that goes wrong in this era can basically be put down to government not wanting to yep. invest, which is very yeah. much the same same thing we see in Britain at almost every level throughout history yeah. ever since Britain really has been part of 
well, has partaken in a democratic electoral yep. system, I think. There we go. Hot takes. Yeah. So, with that thought from Ella, that brings us to the end of what I'm now terming season one of Rails to Nowhere. Yes. So, we're now going to take a bit of a break. Uh, we're not going to take a break from working on this, but we're going to take a bit of a break from putting out episodes until the summer. Yep. So, you should expect another episode. I'm aiming for June or August time. So, some point between June and August, we're hoping to put out begin putting out what we're calling season two. Yep. That's going to start off with a quite a big look at my dissertation work from my recently completed master's. I'm in the process of writing that out into scripts, notes ready for us to record. I'm hoping we might be able to get some guests Fingers um, crossed. at some point during that series, which we're really excited about. At the end of season two, hopefully we'll be taking a look at some islands rather than London, yep. which will be hopefully very interesting. I'll be taking my master's thesis, dissertation, whatever you want to call it, and I'll be turning that into an episode where we'll be looking at weird narrow gauge railways from bits of Britain and the British aligned places you did not realize existed i will not spoil it anymore yeah so it's really exciting we're really looking forward to this but for now i've been simon and she's been eleanor thank you for listening and we'll speak to you again in the summer Rails to Nowhere is presented and produced by me, Simon Sardison Co, and Eleanor Ashton. Principal research for this script was carried out by myself with contributions from Eleanor, and all sources are listed in the show notes. This episode is also derived from an essay written by myself for my master's course, so a massive thank you to Dr. David Turner and Dr. Kevin Tennant for their support in that. Rails to Nowhere is brought to you by listeners just like yourself over at patreon.com forward slash rails to nowhere. Especially thanks to our £10 patron, Valkyrie Lemons. Without your support, this podcast couldn't happen. Until the summer, thank you for listening, and goodbye. Could you spin to your face and your mic face on again? <laughs> Sorry, because echo. It's uh, uh... make it uh twist twisty. Is that better? Much better. Cool. There's gonna be a... <laughs> there's gonna everyone's gonna notice yeah. the audio change halfway through the episode. I'm gonna get rid of that. I don't need that. Um, um you should put a note on the uh, at the end like audio issues. You moved. Yep. No um, either that or I'll put this bit in as the cold open. <laughs> um. <laughs>